Hi, and welcome to this IBC sponsored panel titled Exploring the Rules of the Road for Virtual Production, where we're going to discuss some route guidance and insights to smooth your journey, leveraging VP technology and workflows from an educational, technical, and implement, implementation perspective. I'm Brad Roshan. I'll be moderating this, this panel of uh, some really talented individuals with backgrounds and expertise in various aspects of virtual production, and also um, advisory group members from the SIMTI RIS, which is Rapid Industry Solutions OSVP, Onset Virtual Production Initiative. To get started, I'll, I'll make some quick introductions. First, we have Chaitanya chinch uh, Chaitanya is Vice President and Business Head of Whistling Woods International, and he's also the RAS Education Workstream Co-Chair. Got Paula Suna, she's Senior Project Manager at EVU Technology and Innovation. Got Stefan Heimbetcher, uh, Competence Center Production and Infrastructure at SWR, and he's also Chair of the EVU Strategic Production Program. And rounding out the panel, I have Greg Young, Young, sorry, head of video snack bar at VTR, uh, sorry, VRT Innovation. So let's get started. Uh, this is pretty deep and wide, wide topic. So um, first question is for Chaitanya, and then anyone else from the panel can just jump in if, if you have something further to add. Uh, Chaitanya, VP is such a wide ranging fast moving set of technologies and expertise. Well, education definitely will play a big part in moving forward. So where do you see the state of onset virtual production education today and where is it headed? Where would you like to see it headed? Uh, thanks Brad and thanks for having me on and hello everybody, all the viewers of IBC. Um, well, we wish we were there in person, but you know that didn't happen. So um, we've got us in all boxes now. Um, you know, the for any emerging media technology, for any emerging media workflow, one of the most crucial aspects uh, on how fast it gets into a wide scale adoption is how well the education in it works whether it was the move from film to digital, which was really, really quick, uh, or you know, some of the other areas which took a little bit more time. If you, you know, deep dive into it, you realize education is the key. That's the, that's the bit that makes the difference. And when you start looking at how the education in these areas was uh, executed, you realize there's one crucial or there's two crucial points, right? The, the, the two points that we need to make to both students and working professionals is that a how does this make you or allow you to do things that you are doing already faster cheaper better more efficient and b how does it allow you and enable you to think of things that you would not be able to do before this tech workflow was was invented and once you take these two as your core fulcrums of education, then everything automatically starts to flow from this and fall into place. So then you're able to reach out to students, you're able to reach out to even film faculty and working professionals and explain to them that just like you do uh, production planning in live action production, it's pretty much the same planning that you need to do for virtual production. It's just your tools are different instead of capturing video in cinematography or capturing data in uh, virtual production, it's just data that looks a lot like video. So, you know, sometimes you get confused. And once you're able to drill down um, these elements of uh, the virtual production pipeline uh, into its, its core elements of, you know, the asset, the world, the tracking, and the finishing, you're, you realize that the workflow wasn't that different. It's just newer tools and you now you need to learn the tools. And once you've learned the tools, then you go back to the original filmmaking, film education hypothesis is that human beings are natural storytellers. If, you're, if we are able to wrap our head around the technology of the time, we can tell a compelling story. So as long as we're able to enable 
filmmakers to wrap their head around the technology of virtual production, they'll be able to use it to tell a compelling story. So that's the bedrock we use for education in virtual production. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And I guess it's a, a bit of a moving target too. So I guess that's the that's the secret sauce, right? Is, is yeah. on top of the technology. That, that That's great. I'll, I love that. I'm going to move to Paula. Uh, from an EBU technology perspective and innovation perspective, what new onset virtual production advancements can we expect to see You know, this year, uh, 2022, we're all looking forward to things opening up and, and production taking off again. And what technology is slowing the adoption of moving, you know, moving faster into virtual production? Um, thanks, Brad. Um, um, it's just a guess, but uh, I would say more realistic images content. Uh, uh, I think that we'll see a display with better resolution, color accuracy, dynamic range, matching well together with the cameras, uh, and also uh, a more believable uh, interaction uh, between the performance on the stage and the CG um, characters animated, I think, uh, possibly in real time. I mean, body and face animation. And um, I don't know, maybe also integration of volumetric capture systems, even if these will depend from the quality you can, you can achieve and the bandwidth constraint you can have. And um, I think in general, when we talk about OSVP, uh, I think it's not just a single technology. It's very important to consider the, the full uh, workflow, as also Chetanya was saying before. So the full picture from the conception to the final post-production stage. And uh, for me, virtual production is really a journey that uh, requires sense on experiences uh, to understand and to learn. And this journey, I think it's uh, strictly related and depending from the use case you wanted to consider. Thank you. Right, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting as you know, there's also the green screen LED volume uh, thread that's, that's going on right now. And <clears throat> both those technologies obviously have their, their place. So maybe we can, Kind of explore that a little bit later too. I'd like to get some input from the panel on, on that. Greg, uh, where do you see the current state of, of technology onset virtual production technology and innovation? And what do you see as bright spots uh, this year? Uh, uh, thank you, Brett, uh, to having us on this panel, of course, as well. Um, I, I think at, at the epicenter of um, this new wave that we see, um, yeah, this storm that comes over our industry, I think is the game engine and it's it's, uh, it's it's something very disruptive i think for uh, for our point of view as a broadcaster but as well in, in the film industry is the same is a it's a very powerful creative software it's um yeah it's it's, it's a very powerful graphical engine uh, unseen as ever before and it evolves year by year better and better and of course for our creative content makers it, it opens door that were locked or uh, before and uh, it challenges our technical departments, of course, because we're, as a broadcaster or film industry, not used to work in this uh, game technology. Uh, on the other hand, it's software, so it's very scalable and, and it's um, yeah, something that, that we can interact with. We can, it's modular and, well, it's, it's also, um, as mentioned before, there are different types of, of production where the game engine is, is the epicenter, but you can go to maybe high-end productions as, as Letwal, maybe more for high-end fiction or um, yeah, with a single tracked camera. On the other hand, of course, as a broadcaster, we are more used to using in multicam setups with green keys. And I think uh, another element that pops up more and more is, is just using uh, AR elements in a standard physical uh, set. So there are a lot of new features and on the epicenter is, is this game engine that uh, yeah, fuels our industry with this unlimited uh, new possibilities. Right. Uh, when you mention AR elements, I guess as a, as a broadcaster, what, what types of productions do you see? Yeah. Where, where would you see that being used initially? And I think the most famous use case is, is the weather station. Uh, right. So it, it's, a, it's a very famous case. I think a lot of people ha have seen where suddenly a car drops down in the studio next to the host. Right. <laughs> we, 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 we do similar things, but in a, in, a, in a lesser fashion, let's say like this. 
uh, okay. but it's, it's most of the time, I think, in, in a news kind of setup where you want to have maybe a graphical uh, visual representation or you want to have maybe uh, the, the satellite news uh, space telescope that that's just been introduced. It's very um, yeah, interesting to show it in a 3D perspective instead of just a, a 2D flat uh, picture. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, definitely the weather stuff is, that helps amazing. tell the story for sure. Yeah. And there's some very creative stuff I've seen, like volcanoes and all kinds of stuff this, this past year. So definitely helps uh, visualize things for sure. Um, let's move back, uh, Paula, uh, from an EBU perspective, like what type of production is seeing the fastest transition to, to onset virtual production? Like, are you seeing particular types of production like you know lower end medium high end or yeah. commercial versus film versus you know broadcast mm -hmm. yes because um as if you a few months ago i think it was before christmas so we started a new working group it's called led world virtual production um to understand better how OSVP is relevant for public broadcasters and also the editorial financial production uh, in terms of workflow skills implication. And um, at least in this working group as type of production, we are not considering high budget production such as the Mandalorian. So they are completely out of the scope, I would say. And together with the EBU members, uh, like also what, uh, what Greg said just before, we are focusing on multiple camera broadcast production. So thinking of uh, uh, virtual uh, news, uh, sport, uh, studio, children TV, talk show as potential genres of interest, I would say. And I want to add also that as a view, um, we are having one-to-one -one chat with the different industry professionals involved in this field because we want to carry out a pilot, uh, possibly by March, April this year. Uh, even if we don't know yet if we will use an existing studio or maybe we'll rent the equipment and then we will build a studio from scratch. And um, nice. this, is a, this is, I think, it's by itself a learning experience. And as I said before, the pilot um, um, should be around a talk show with a real guest, a teleported guest, uh, and uh, CG animated uh, in real time, I hope, characters. So stay tuned for the next update on the TechEBU website. Yeah, definitely the hands-on stuff. I know I'm around, around the globe, yeah. seeing a lot of studios just kind of set up as R&D studios, right? Because yeah. it's... In theory, this stuff works, but in practice, because there's so many moving parts, it's it's getting yes. getting your hands on it, right? Um, yes, it's there, important. Can yes. can our viewers can they? I guess they can find some of this information on the EBU website. Yes, we're going to publish soon because we are still discussing with some industry providers. So so we'll publish soon uh, a little bit, a bit more about what we wanted to do. Nice. No, that, that, that's great. Appreciate it. Yes, and I think it's going to be a kind of a, a mixed style a, a, a workshop, but also training and some experience. So let's see. Fingers crossed. Yeah. No, looking forward to it. Thanks for for pushing that initiative. Uh, it's it's helpful for the industry, right? It's 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 what we need to see more of. Uh, Chaitanya, of all the dozens of of skill sets out there and, and positions involved with onset virtual production. We've got a good wall chart at the uh, on the SIMT uh, RIS page that explores kind of, um, you know, at least the top layer of, of all the different uh, positions and, and workflows. Uh, which ones kind of are the, do you think are the toughest to master and which ones provide a good entry point uh, for the next generation of production experts? Um, so, you know, and, you know, it's very good that you mentioned the wall chart. I mean, if I, if I may just would actually help if, uh, we could just have a look at it. So this is what the, the wall chart is, which essentially breaks down the, the process of virtual production into multiple areas of creative, uh, VAD building assets and managing data, uh, on set, which is the actual production element and then post-production. Uh, ranging, covering a, a, a skill knowledge base which, re, which ranges from creative production to engineering. Now, for 
anybody at any point of time to look at this and say this box is harder than that is uh, would would not be i mean it would be facetious because everybody needs to do their job right not just everybody needs to do their job right everybody who plans how everybody is going to do their job also needs to do it right and that's by far been the biggest lacuna so if you ask right now it's the vp studio executives it's the vp technical directors it's the it's the virtual produce production really it's the 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 vp supervisor who's where the most amount of skill sets are needed because they have the most number of variables to play with and their variables are not only creative or technical their variables are also um ip related because there are so many proprietary technologies that are knocking around right now and trying to plug into each other that uh, you know literally uh, every day there is uh, something new that's being added on to some software and some patch that suddenly stops working with some yeah. tracking uh, system and you know suddenly it stops reading on unity or unreal and you're like what what happened yesterday it was fine and you know you have no idea but overnight it's updated in the background so uh, it's like i uh, you know i just we keep telling students that you know the reason why it's so hard is because you're trying to teach somebody how to ride a bike while the bike is still being put together and while you're riding the bike somebody is taking the engine out and putting a new one and you know changing the back wheel while you're still you know while you're still revving yeah, so yeah. It, it's really that's the that's the analogy so everything is hard everything is difficult uh but the good thing is that if you approach it thinking that everything is hard and everything is difficult suddenly it starts to become a little easier right but you know if you uh, do uh, behave like yeah yeah you know what this is a piece of cake i'll crack it you're done yeah so i mean that's that's really how uh, we look at it we uh, we look at it as um we are we are trying to essentially this is the the last day that we're ever going to get to work on virtual production so we have to make this work and we we think of that every day in the emerging media lab that we have at wisting woods only then we are able to come up with solutions and solutions and solutions and i must say one of the uh, you know the the um partnerships and the camaraderie that software and hardware manufacturers have displayed over the last year year or two in reaching out and trusting labs and institutes with beta and in some cases even alpha level software almost at the code level to enable them to actually uh, do the the kind of applied work that is needed to be done with the hardware and software which is the only way that virtual production is going to work right and that's where the biggest learning has come from so you know um organizations and you know like azure kinect sensors and all the entire ecosystem that's built around it or uh, moses and stipe and the star tracker and all their their entire ecosystem and the beta softwares that have been written around them so it, it's really that so uh you know in a in a if i had to summarize this in a line all of it is hard but it's made easier by everybody working together awesome thanks stefan i think i i skipped over uh your slot for the question so i'm going to jump to you <laughs> next no here problem. um it's been I'm, i'm a bit rusty at this it's been a, it's been a while so uh <laughs> I apologize uh so as a as a public broadcaster at SWR will be looking for obviously interoperability and standards to put the best systems together. Can you speak to the efforts um um and how that aligns with the ongoing work at at Simpty? Absolutely Brad. Yeah, sure. Um well, I I think I have to say that uh, with regard to the SMPTE initiative, we are probably the baby of the RIS uh, OSBP family in <laughs> that we are at the very beginning. If you if you look at me if you would see me in full scale you wouldn't say I'm a baby but <laughs> because I'm 6 foot 8 but, ah. <laughs> but uh, in, in terms of this uh, uh, you know we feel like uh, uh, the baby in, in the family there because we are at the very beginning 
which makes it so important uh, to see the focus on education that Shantaya was uh, uh, um, talking about all the time. And we saw the wall chart, which is a good starting point for someone like us who is really just starting into this world. So the good news for us is uh, towards the end of last year, you know, we set uh, um, all the right uh, switches to the right passes in terms of making some uh, internal very critical and major decisions that will, will allow us to, to go ahead at full speed now. And that is what we're doing. Um, and, and yes, you know, um, in doing so, of course, um, what you mentioned, interoperability uh, as well as standards are important. Interoperability, of course, is another uh, segment or section of the work at the IRS. Um, uh, we just had a, 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 another call uh, last night and, and it's, it's always very helpful to get all the feedback from those colleagues that are a lot further advanced in this and that are dialing in from set and stuff. Um, so um, that, that, that helps a lot. In terms of standards, I think that's not an, a, a, a virtual production problem, that is more of a generic problem is, is that standards these days are not as rapid anymore as this initiative is. So they are naturally always behind uh, innovation. And that makes it difficult, especially for a public broadcaster that likes uh, to be uh, uh, ba uh, based on standards uh, um, uh, uh, very much, that you have to wait a lot longer than your friends from the more private side of uh, uh, things that might take uh, a push into the market a little bit earlier. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, it feels like we are really ready to go. And uh, not only are we looking at uh, what is happening at SEMT with this initiative, of course, we are also working very closely. You mentioned my double role uh, in the EBU uh, with, uh, with regard to what uh, Paula already referred to. Uh, very exciting about that, that proof of concept because, and I hope we will get to do this really by starting from scratch and by building our our own kind of student. If, if we have to do it in Lego, let's do it in Lego. I don't, yeah, whatever yeah. whatever, it, whatever it takes. <laughs> but hands-on, pragmatic way uh, moving forward is, is typically, from my experience, uh, what what uh, what uh, brings, brings the best results because you learn so much more than just reading uh, 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 how to do some uh, some sort of stuff. So yeah, so that's uh, what, what what we are at at the moment. So unfortunately, not that much of an experience that we can share at this point in time, but I hope we will catch up uh, soon and we'll soon be in the position to also provide input into the work of the RIS and also of course, into the work of the EBU. Yeah, well, we're definitely very fortunate to have you and your team on uh, on this initiative, uh, you know, the RIS initiative, because it, it does bring a fresh set of, set of eyes and Chaitanya kind of hit it. It's, it's like a, definitely a team effort. And if you go in thinking, you know, everything you're going to get into trouble. So yeah. you're, you're, you bring a fresh perspective. So that's, yeah. that's definitely useful to, to all involved. And, and you can tell that Chaitanya has already fully embraced in the, in the virtual production world because uh, he wouldn't uh, get away with that shirt in the green screen. Uh, world, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's funny. Um, Greg, uh, in, in which uh, onset virtual production technology do you see the, the highest pricing pressure currently? Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, people are putting productions together and it's going to end up on some accountant's desk and they're going to, or producer's desk, and they're going to question every penny they're spending. And, mm -hmm. and do you have any future predictions, um, you know, looking out five and, and 10 years, like how, how is pricing pressures and technology is going to, how are they going to affect what we're do, seeing today? Um, yeah, as we see at, at VRT uh, as a broadcaster, um, we see different types of productions and one are more low cost and other ones are um, yeah, maybe multicam setups for linear television, which are most costly. Uh, but I think the, the, maybe the most pressure is on the human resources. And, and it's very comparable to what uh, that, uh, uh, that Tanya already said before. I think it's, it's a very past um, industry, uh, very past moving ahead technology. And we're not used to work with this technology. So uh, you have to learn it while, while you're moving. And um, there are different components if you look at the wall chart as well. So you have, for instance, uh, 3D design. 
it's not something that every broadcast or media company has just uh, as, as a fully department available, especially the 3D artists who are used to work for uh, who used to work for a, a game engine, because of course there are uh, certain requirements uh, to to let it. Uh, the performance is really, of course, uh, one of the key elements that you're monitoring all all of the time, yeah. and um, or maybe uh, tracking data. So the same, you're using different type of cameras, different tra tracking systems. How do you monitor them? Combine them? It's something really new for us. So do you outsource it or do you uh, yeah try yeah. to build the expertise in house yeah. indeed indeed and i think that's something that's that's uh, if you look at pricing of course there are not it's not there are not a lot of seats uh, over or extra to fill so that's something uh, i think every yeah, broadcast media company has, has to look at right right uh Stefan, are you seeing similar things on your end like where, where are you finding people and is it basically trying to find bring people in from the outside or just get them move someone from maybe linear graphics more into this space and get them to learn some unreal yeah that's, that's part of uh, of the uh, experience that we're gathering at this point in time i think what's what's always important with these kind of digital transfer uh, transformation uh, activities is that you must not forget that it's not all about technology. It's a lot about um, the human beings involved. It's a lot about change management overall. It's a lot about uh, change of mindset uh, and stuff. And, and people tend to forget that uh, and are carried away about all the new stuff that, that, that and all the new possibilities. Um, so that's, that's critical, of course. And you always have, uh, have, have the fear of people to be replaced by technology and an automated uh, uh, functionality and so on. So that's that's something that you have to keep in mind for this. What we are uh, looking at at the moment is, or what we're realizing is that um, our, our feel is that uh, most of the experience that we that we see in in uh, on-site virtual production to date is more from the Mandalorian style kind of world. So single camera, non-life, fictional production. And that, of course, is very much in contrast to what we like to do. And uh, Paola already alluded to that a little bit in, in terms of what we have in mind from a broadcaster perspective, which is more uh, uh, looking into a live uh, kind of world, looking into multi-camera, uh, looking into a, a news or sports programming, a talk show, what have you. And I think that's the stuff where it becomes interesting. As far as I uh, am aware, um, uh, uh, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, VRT has already done some uh, some uh, early work in that regard, and that's, that's very, very helpful. Um, and from, from what I hear, it has been very successful also, and it, it probably has been pushed by the pandemic also, like so many things these days. Um, so, but yeah, so, and, and, and at the end of the day, what we need to understand is, is uh, whether the benefits and the cost savings and what have you that people are experiencing from on-site virtual production in the non-broadcast world, whether we can also find that um, for, for the broadcast, more broadcast related scenarios. Right. Um, and, and that is going to be, uh, I think one of the key elements and key uh, objectives um, of the aforementioned EBU uh, proof of concept. And that is also what we have in mind um, when we now start uh, setting up uh, our virtual uh, production um, in-house. And then, yeah, all the fun stuff begins as soon as you move into that. And once you have the wall set up and, 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 um, and just seeing, yeah, so, you know, how will people react? Will they see the benefits? Will they, will they only see the challenges? Will they see the fear in terms of, oh, you know, all the stuff that I've been working on for the past 20 years is now completely obsolete? So it, it, I think it's, it's all this kind of stuff. And um, but again, this is not anything specific to uh, on-site virtual production as such. This is something that all of us are dealing with for quite a while now with every step that we take into the digital world. So you would hope that to a certain degree, we know what we're talking about, but with every new introduction of a new technology or innovation, I think the, the process just repeats all over again, right? Right, yeah, thank you. Um, Greg, Stefan uh, mentioned you and in, in, uh, you know some of the work that you guys have done. Can you maybe just add a little bit more to that? 
Uh, yeah, I think yeah, there are there are different uh, ways of approach different productions, and because it's free software at the end and it's very open, um, we started out actually with a very low setup. Doing uh, during the, um, the epidemic, we had a lot of internal um, webinars and we wanted to spice it up a little bit. So we tested if it worked with a game engine, just basically one PC <laughs> running a game engine on, and then um, putting people in a, in a more studio in, environment. And we, we, uh, we put some extra development on it. We, we learned it ourselves. We, we got some external advice. And now we are running uh, different virtual productions. Actually, as we speak, we are uh, working on one. On my background, you can see a virtual production for uh, children where we infuse nice. uh, 2D avatars who are live uh, uh, interactive. So hosts are sitting before a webcam interacting with, with avatars and there's a live host in the studio and we're mixing all together in the game engine in the, in the 3D space. And it's just on one year time that we involved uh, in-house yeah. production. So it's possible and, and uh, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve, but indeed um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what you can achieve in a very short yeah. time. Yeah, maybe one of the silver linings of the pandemic is you're kind of forced to think out of the box and just just put things together. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I've got a couple other questions here. I think we still have a, a little bit of time. Uh, Paula, on the green screen versus LED, do you do you, do you guys do any research and look at? That's, not yet, I would say. Yeah. It's going to be part of this working group. Uh, I mean, okay. if I think that both technologies will coexist and it will depend really from the type of production you want to do. And, right. Um, it's, it's putting the right tool in the right place, right? Yes. yes they both have yes. strengths, right? Yes. right. Okay. Um, maybe if someone wants to speak to just leveraging the game, the game engine, like it is, you know, Epic, it's an open source game engine and it's not the only one out there, but it, it seems to be the one primarily used in media and entertainment. You know, there's Unity and there's some other, the other ones out there too. Um, is that, obviously it's, it's, it's really accelerated uh, virtual production, but is it, and it's just one little piece of it, is it going to slow things down or is it going to speed things up? Like, because it is a game engine, right? So, so uh, I just, like to come in, I'll also actually uh, want to make a point on something that I think Paula had mentioned uh, a while ago, which is that we have to stop looking at virtual production as meant to serve only the Mandalorian, Blade Runner 2049, yeah. that level of content, right? Right. It could, um, I think 99% of, or a significant majority of the virtually produced content is going to be those key four or five or 10 shots in an otherwise two-hour film. Uh, and it's those shots that really take the film and elevate it to a point that justifies spending that kind of money on those shots. So, uh, yes, you know, there's a, there's a joke in the industry that until unless you're, you're, you're making rom-coms using a particular technology, it's not mainstream. I really hope they don't end up using virtual production to make rom-coms because that will guarantee make it completely financially uh, you know inefficient so that the what what we have to realize is that you there is a there is a role that it fulfills there is a role that uh, a drone fulfills every shot is not taken by a drone right it, just like that there is a role that virtual production fulfills in the pipeline and we have to make sure that just because it's there you don't end up using it for anything that where you don't need it and uh, we were kind of, uh, that was something that we, uh, we at the Whistling Woods Lab started to do when we decided to uh, partner with a, a filmmaker to, uh, who wanted to make an entire short fiction film uh, on the virtual production platform. And then we kind of started working with him. And then we realized that a lot of it actually doesn't need to be uh, virtually produced. So the key elements continued to be uh, shot made do, using virtual production. And then the rest of it was, you know, just short live action pretty much uh, regularly. 
And uh, that enabled the film to come out with a very different look in a good combination, good contrast between the, the look and feel of the virtually produced shots and the, uh, the, the live action shots. That short fiction film is currently screening at the Rotterdam Film Festival. Yes. So um, it's it, uh, what, what, what I think is that the more and more and more of such things that you start to see, which is bottom of the pyramid or middle of the pyra pyramid volume content where there are key uh, uh, shots using, you know, with which are virtually produced, the more and more and more of that you start to see, the more and more and more industry adoption will come in and, you know, they won't start, it, it, people won't be worried about approaching this uh, kind of workflow, right? right? So that's the the first bit. And the second bit that, you know, with your the question that you asked, um, so when when we look at it at at an educational at an academic level right the 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 common way to look at it is you know what let's just forget about the led let's just do the uh, green screen right what people don't realize is that each whether it's a uh, full cg virtual production on set virtual production or in camera vfx again are specific they, they perform specific functions and specific tasks and somebody who's never worked on a LED volume stage before and has just worked on a green screen volume stage before will not be able to transition that easily in a commercial environment to an LED, which is why students need to be trained on all three of them, right? So full CG right. as well as uh, a green screen as well as LED walls and that's the way that we're approaching it. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely a topic of conversation at the the SIMTI initiative. We've got the there's a lot of education content being put together, and it's not just SIMTI's kind of looking as a at a at it as a repository because there's lots of other organizations, EBU and and, and others that are generating um, educational content. You know, Epic and and, and uh, different vendors and and stuff too. Uh, so we've kind of got the education work stream and then the infrastructure work stream um spreading out spreading out the knowledge right paula did you have something uh, no i was thinking a bit um because i think it's it's not all about the game engine i would say at least talking speaking about the cg characters for example greg and i uh, were recently in one of the abc accelerator stream called smart that and then I was really surprised about the quality you can get uh, using some, in, in, um, in this accelerator, they were AI driven tools right. uh, that can be used together with the game engine. So for example, just to mention a few of them, uh, you can use Radical and then you have the plugin integrated already in a real, also we used also Omniverse from NVIDIA and the Machinima yeah. engine. And then uh, you have just to upload your video and then it's just you in front of the camera or the iPhone and then you upload the video and then you get through this AI machine learning, deep learning system, you get to the skeletal animation. Yeah, uh, or res yes, yeah. respeature as voice cloning or move.ai. I mean, I was really surprised to see the, the, the great quality you can achieve using all these tools. Uh, plugged into the, the 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 game engine. Sorry to to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that, those are great points. Like the A, we didn't even we didn't even touch on the AI part of this, which I think could be a, a whole new panel, right? Uh, there's just so much going on. It's 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 pretty crazy. So we've got just a couple minutes left here. I wanted to do uh, a bonus round here uh, for the panel, and uh, you can you can choose not to answer if if you if you like, but I thought it'd be Kind of fun to wrap up um, with. A, here's the question: Explain the metaverse and why it is important to onset virtual production. I maybe start. Let's start with Greg, and we can we can go around the table here. Thank you, Brett. Put me first. <laughs> this question. <laughs> You're a winner. <laughs> no. Um, no answer is wrong, by the way. Right? No, and I, 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 uh, uh, I I'm gonna. Uh, just give a, a flow of consciousness here, uh, if, if I may, um, yeah. because uh, what you see happening with, with in virtual production is that you you blend in this real world with with the virtual world, and I think that that's what ultimately is happening in the metaverse as well. That it's become uh, yeah, 
un unrecognizable which is real and which is virtual and that we uh, we will be this kind of um literally in in between two worlds i think there, there's a lot of we say that it's, it's the hype of the moment so i think um yeah, we'll see where we get because there's a very interesting i think um talk from um it was at seagraph from uh, i think uh, the the ceo of uh, epic games uh, sweeney yeah. And it's really interesting because he takes every component, technical component, and he says like, ah, if you want to go to the metaverse, you need this part and it's now at this stage and it still has involved to that stage. And uh, I think that's interesting to look at it in, in this way. Uh, but indeed, I think VR maybe today is the, the closest we come to metaverse and we have this like uh, um, yeah, multiverse or multi-user experiences in VR, VR chat, or um, uh, uh, Neos VR. So this social VR horizon from Facebook. That's yeah. maybe if you ask me today, what, what is the metaverse or which is the closest step to to the metaverse? It's one of these platforms, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's interesting take on it for sure. <laughs> uh, who wants to go next here? Ste Stefan, what do you? Sure, uh, what Greg said. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. talking, of, <laughs> talking apart. No, I think, but uh, actually, yes, a lot of uh, what you said is, is true. You know, I think metaverse is a point when, when we ever come to it is when we finally completely lose track of uh, <laughs> anything. So, uh, you know, what's real, what's not. Uh, I think uh, when we can't figure it out anymore, then we have arrived at metaverse. Right now, to me, the metaverse feels like an octopus. Uh, you know, we know an octopus yeah. has, eight, has eight arms, that's for sure. Uh, it also has three hearts and it has nine brains. But for uh, the metaverse at the moment to me is an octopus with no brain. Uh, and we can discuss how many hearts it has. Uh, There's that's a, that's a different story. But so what I'm trying to say is, I think we're st still pretty much in the buzzword phase when it comes to metaverse. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I haven't been to CES, but just what, what I read about CES in terms of metaverse was enough uh, to get the picture of what happened there in terms of metaverse and uh, you know their path is with, with almost pretty much everything that there is you know everything's now metaverse like whatever 10 years ago when things suddenly became smart now they become somehow metaverse or whatever so having said that i think we're lacking a little bit of a substance at the moment it's 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 it's, it's, it's formless at this point in time I'm sure uh, it will get uh, to something more concrete uh, over time, but uh, I'm always uh, very skeptical with these kind of things that uh, seem to be appearing out of nowhere. You know, the one day nobody heard about it, the next day it's all over the news. Yeah, such as somebody just switched the button. Names. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, like that. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's my take of metaverse at this point in time. But yeah. certainly, it, it is very close to to our topic of uh, virtual production. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, Paula. I still remember Second Life, I would say. Ah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I read also the metaverse, I would say, the book, Snow, what was the name, Snow Crash or something like that. Right. I don't know. I've read many, many definitions, and um, I liked uh, uh, the definition coming from uh, Wunderman Thompson Consultancy Consultancy Company. So they have defined the metaverse like an interconnected and limitless virtual world. And so they've given also a nice example. So think about the user um, hopping between the different virtual experiences, so the users going to one of these virtual shops and buy a sport outfit for his air avatar, but at the same time going to another place and buy a, a pair of shoes that will be delivered to the user in, in the real world, or maybe popping into a virtual concert while running with friends in the real world. I don't know uh, what I think personally that it's a little bit early. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, at least also to understand the implication for the broadcasters and also to define these um, intertwined, I would say, real and virtual use cases and experiences. So right. <laughs> let's yeah, see. No. It is early for sure. <laughs> yeah, Titania. Titania. Yeah. 
I, uh, I, so, I, I know um, you have an opinion on this. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm actually I actually look at it as slightly differently. I look at it to uh, the answer to the question, what next? Uh, if you look at content over the last 50 years, uh, it's uh, we have we have given it more and more and more body volume dimension, whatever you want to call it, right? From um, relatively low quality moving images, we went uh, you know HD and Dolby surround sound and immersive, and then we went stereoscopy, and then we went. Uh, you know, a little bit of uh, almost, um, I think, Matrix took us to the next level with bullet time where the, where the viewer felt like he was, she was inside the shot. So um, I think Metaverse is, is kind of the next step towards that, uh, towards the, the merger of the viewer with the content. And the content uh, may be uh, just social interactive content. It may be uh, entertainment content. Um, it's some kind of experience. So um, just like the, the goal of all entertainment is to kind of make sure that the viewer is engaged for as much time as they've asked for his time or her time. I think that's going to be the metaverse's biggest challenge as well. Yes, it's great that you're going to put somebody in an alternate universe, alternate world. Are you going to be able to entertain them or engage them for long yeah. enough? And yeah. that's where uh, the bigger challenge will be. Technology will get sorted. I mean, yes. uh, we never thought that, well, at least in India, we never thought seven years ago that, uh, uh, six years ago, that 70% of all content consumed today will be on the cell phone. So, uh, tech is not something that I'm really sweating. I'm really sweating our ability to be able to uh, put together engaging content and engaging experience in this new tech world that we're creating. And honestly, that's what I'm waiting for. I mean, can will what Felix and Paul did with VR, can somebody do for the metaverse? Yeah, and I, I think you nailed it. I mean, we're in the media and entertainment industry and entertainment is really the focus, right? That's our That's our customers, so. Yeah, if I may also, the devices, I don't know, it's still unclear in which way you, you'll get access to the metaverse. So yeah. I think that's, that's going to be really right. <laughs> important. We've, we've run out of time here and we've, uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground, obviously just scratched the surface on some of it. This is, sure. uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have more panels and dig a little bit deeper into some of these, some of these areas. But I, I really want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day at you know, different hours of the day and, and joining us here. And it, it feels good. I mean, it would, it would have been nice to be in Amsterdam doing this, which is what we had planned, but we'll, we'll look for 2022 is looking pretty more positive. So uh, anyway, I, I thank you so much for, for joining us and for making this uh, such a great panel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Brad. Bye -bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.